started. We are getting a private lecture, right? Uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, I will be talking today uh, about using simple statistics with Excel, and simple is really simple, so I really I will be going through the basics. Um, my name is Aniko Sabo, and I'm a professor, uh, associate professor here at the Division of Biostatistics, and I'm also the director of Consulting Center, so if you have other questions, we can talk about them later, but uh, we are the source for uh, consulting services here at the uh, college. Uh, here is my disclosure, is that pretty much that I have no disclosures, no conflicts of interest. Uh, uh, but uh, I also would like to ask you to fill out the CME evaluation forms. Even if you are not asking for a CME credit, the evaluation forms do help us to improve our services. Uh, so the outline of my talk uh, is shown here. First, I'll talk a little bit about data entry, how you want to enter data into Excel so that it is useful for analysis, uh, how to obtain descriptive statistics, mostly means and cross tabulations and so the basic descriptives, and a little bit about statistical inference, uh, mostly t-test and some regression methods. Uh, and all the specifics I'll be showing you are for Excel 2007. So if I show you that here is the button to push, then it's in Excel 2007. The other versions are similar, but of course the exact location of the buttons and menu items are a little bit changed. Um, so Excel has uh, two ways of, of doing data analysis. Some are built-in functions that are available immediately as you have ex Excel Excel, but the other things you need to add, uh, install the data analysis add-in. And it's really the install, installation is not, you don't need a CD or anything for it, you just have to ch check an appropriate button in Excel to do that. And I'll sh it's quite hidden, it took me a while to figure it out in this version. Uh, so uh, I'll show you it in a moment that you know you have to go through the office button. There is a, a link to options, and there is a tab that about add-ins, and at the bottom you can find how to add uh, this in. And what you will get is in the data tab you will get a little new button that says data analysis. So. Uh, here is my Excel. So uh, the way to install it would be here. There is here is Excel options, and there is an add-ins, and you have to manage Excel add-ins. You can see that I have already the analysis tool pack installed, but. So once you manage, hit go, you can click which add-ins you want to do, and then OK, and it got installed. Otherwise, it's not available directly. So once you do that, in the Data tab, which I have opened, you get this Data Analysis button. And that will do this addition, some of the additional things I'll be showing you. So, how, so first, uh, with data, how do you get it into Excel? So you can enter it directly in Excel, and lots of people do that. They use data Excel as the data collection tool. Uh, you can also import it from uh, other files uh, if you have it collected in a text file or an access database. You can also import it from a web page, from pretty much any web page that has data that looks like tab arranges tables. You can import it into Excel. And also, uh, sometimes it's useful, you can just copy and paste it from a Word document or a PDF file. You can paste it uh, into your Excel file, and usually it will actually quite nicely separate into uh, columns and uh, different cells. Uh, there is also, if it happens to paste everything into one column, instead of separating into multiple columns as you want it, there's a little so-called text-to-columns wizard that you can use. Um, I'll show you how to get it in from a web page because that's a little bit less obvious thing to do. But many of these things are available through this uh, data tab and specifically through the get external data. And here is the text to column if you ever need to do that one. So what I'll try to do is show how to get 
uh, from a web page, except I don't have web internet access right now, but here's the website I would be getting it from. So I have it saved from in a local file, actually. So uh, I can access data from web, So, but you can see that you have access database or text file or other things you could have. And here I'll just enter the name of the file where I have it saved. But again, and that is just an error, but you could pretty much browse to uh, enter a name of the website. So this is actually what's represented on the website, and it recognizes where tables are. All right, so there are two tables, and I can, this yellow arrows show that there's a table. If I check, then this table will get imported. I check this one, it will get imported, and I tell it to import, and it asks me where to, so I'll click on the cell where I want to start it, and there it is, my data is imported. So uh, any data you find on the web that you like and you want to use, you can import it like this. Uh, whenever you are entering data yourself, uh, the first thing you have to decide is how you are going to arrange the data. And there are lots of ways you can come up with, but. So what I'm going to show you is what makes it the best for analysis, and especially if you want to have somebody else do the analysis. Especially if you are using Excel as the data entry, and then you want to give it somebody else to analyze it a statistical package, then this is almost a must, because that's how statistical packages are expected. But it is a really helpful, this uh, approach, even if you are going to analyze it in Excel. So the, uh, the structure should be what I'll call a list. Uh, it means that each cell should have only one value, so don't put two values with a slash or comma or s separated by stuff like that. Each column contains one variable, one uh, type of information, and each row contains information about one subject uh, or one unit of observation, whatever you are measuring. Uh, and and any other thing, any other physical arrangement or spacing, like leaving empty rows or uh, coloring the cells or the lines, you shouldn't carry any additional information. So if you have a variable, you know, you have two groups of subjects, you cannot just set, you know, first group of subject under it, a second group of subject with an empty space and assume that just because they're separated, everybody will know that it's really two groups. You have to have an additional column that carries this information that it's group one and it, the second group is group two. Uh, and also, uh, it's very helpful if each row is self-contained. So I can get all the information about that sub, uh, subject looking only that row. So a common way uh, of doing a non-self-contained is again if you say have two groups and you would put a heading, group one, and then you have the information for the group one, and if I look at the seventh row, I would have to look up and figure out that it's group one. So I mean, as a human being, of course, I can do that, but as a computer, I cannot. So that's why it's very important that uh, each row would, should have, gr the information that's group one should be repeated in every row, one, 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 one. It's kind of repetitive, but that's the only way to make sure that the information carries around well and stays together. So this is kind of a list structure. Uh, other important uh, ideas is you should try at least not to mix data with analysis. So data should be in one's place and if whatever analysis you do, preferably even a separate worksheet, but certainly not like an, an additional row. Sometimes I see people add means at the bottom as a last row. And while that's a very con con convenient place to put at, it will likely to get confused with data. I had one example when I was analyzing some microarray data and then we had a disagreement about the number of genes and it turns out that in row number 4,097 4, that was a row of means. And of course I didn't scroll down all the way there to look at it, so I was thinking it's data because it's right there. So you have tried to keep things separately. Um, and uh, other contentious issue and difficulty will is with missing values. Uh, so uh, 
statistical packages usually don't insist on this, but Excel, you usually would want to have missing values to be empty cells, uh, meaning certainly not zeros. Uh, other, if you are exporting your data later or so somewhere else, you can actually use some kind of notation, textual notations like NA or a period, you know, different conventions can be used, but you certainly want to be consistent. You don't want to have different things denoting the same message that it's missing. So here's an example of an uh, Excel spreadsheet, or at least a table that looks like an Excel spreadsheet, that is not a list. Okay, so even though, and by the way, it's not real data, these are made up numbers. Okay, and I played with it, made it worse than it ever was. Okay, but I, uh, I'm just trying to show you some things that you shouldn't do. Uh, so the, this arrangement is actually, you know, it's actually quite thoughtful, so it's not a haphazard arrangement, right? So it, um, the investigator did consider how to put this together, right? So you can see you have four groups of subjects, and, and actually I think these are animals, okay? So not humans, but the number's made up anyway. So, uh, and for each uh, subject, you had measurements of the cholesterol, total cholesterol, and say HDL cholesterol. But, so we, you can see that the columns are not variables, right? Not different variables because say cholesterol represents four columns and even though it's the same thing, right? Same conceptual variable. And it's not true that each row is one subject because it can, contains data from multiple subjects, right? Uh, it, it, this also has analysis, right? Summary statistics mixed right in with the data. And some things that are big no-nos, it has, uh, you can see here, you know, missing values indicated by different strings. You know, here is a little comment added to a cell. Now, if you add a comment like that, you can do that, but know that it will be totally ignored in the analysis. So you cannot ever put anything meaningful there. In Excel, you can add a comment to a cell, and all you will see is this little red triangle. And also, here is one item that's highlighted in red. And again, that's okay, as long as it doesn't mean anything. But if it means that, oh, this was our highest observation, then actually we have our measurement tool cannot measure anything above 400, and it actually means that it is 399 or more, then that's a big problem. So certainly, because then this red color means something that is certainly not captured in any other way. So you, can, that's, um, you cannot have that. So how would we rearrange it as a list? We would have three columns because there are three pieces of information, which group, the cholesterol measurement, and the HDL measurement. And actually, this rearrangement immediately emphasizes that actually these were measured on the same animals, right? So in the previous arrangement, you couldn't see which cholesterol measurement me paired up with which HDL measurement. Right? And you see that the group is, uh, group number is repeated, right, for every row. Uh, it's also helpful that the titles have no special characters. This is helpful when you want to <coughs> export it to somewhere else because other software might not like spaces in the names of variables. Excel won't care too much specifically. And also the averages, standard deviations are not part of the data. I coded, changed the missing value coding so that it's now at least consistent, right? It, and, and, and per A, and per A. For Excel, actually, for the further analysis, I'll uh, make blank cells because that uh, only way Excel can handle them in the analysis. And I removed all extra notations, the highlightings, the whatever. So this is a list format, and that's kind of what you should uh, strive for when you're collecting, uh, entering data. Uh, sometimes you need to do, you, you collect some data and you want to do some, uh, uh, some transformation it, uh, calculations based on the data. And it's very useful to let uh, Excel do it. So sometimes uh, people, you know, take out a calculator and calculate, or uh, you can use a common situation I see when you have a date of uh, some surgery and the 
date of some event and people sit down and try to figure out how many days have been in between. And that's, for example, a very difficult calculation, but you can figure it out in your head. So you shouldn't try, try not to do anything like that, but let uh, formulas uh, in Excel handle situations like that. So anything that can be calculated, you shouldn't be doing separately. You should be doing it within Excel because at least then the arithmetic will be correct. Uh, and to, so to use formulas, you, have, uh, you put an equal sign in the beginning of in the text of the cell, that's how you start it, and then Excel will think it is a formula. So if you have a transformed value, for example, here I want to create ratio of cholesterol to HDL level, uh, then I could create uh, equal sign, and then I refer to the cell by its column and row number, A2 divided by B2, right? And so that will make, you know, th this divided by this. Now it is very, boring to keep typing this for everyone, but what you can do is then copy this and paste it under uh, for the other cells and it will automatically be updated. So Excel will update the references, so once you copy it in the next row, A2 becomes A3 and B2 becomes B3. And you know, as you copy in different columns, it also will get updated. Yes? Mm -hmm. So what if you put context to column D, would, that, would it create a column D for that, and then the, the, the data would appear there? No. Right. So uh, this is not actually, so this equal A to B2 is actually what's inside there. Oh, what's in there. Oh. Right, that's what I mean. So because I c I'll show you it in, in a moment in Excel, but I cannot show you both the formula and the value at the same time. Okay. So if we go to our spreadsheet, so here's my example data. So if I want to create the ratio column, so I can enter equal, and actually I don't even have to type A2, or in this case actually B2, right? I can click on this cell, I click on the B2 cell and it enters, then I click slash and I click on the other side, B2 divided C2 in this case because my column numbers are different. And after the enter, the value that shows is 9.7, but if I click on it, its content is actually B2 over C2. All right, so that's why I couldn't show that at the same time on the uh, PowerPoint. So now if I copy it, okay, so maybe right click copy, and then go all the way down, highlight where I want to paste, paste, so everything, uh, you can see that the formula got updated, B3 over C3. If I were to copy it on the next column, then again, it would be the column numbers, will, uh, column names will be updated. So now I have a new column, and so of course there's some problem here because I have a missing value here, so it cannot divide by zero, so I, I could have written a smarter formula that first checks and then divides, but I'll show you the average, right? So uh, this is, you, often you want just a simple arithmetic expression, but you also can do more complicated things. Uh, you can use built-in functions to calculate, for example, averages and so on. So there, there are many built-in functions, but commonly used by the right average, median, standard deviation. So for example, the spreadsheet I showed you before where the summary statistics were right after. Actually, they were not the hand collected by hand, but actually what's inside those uh, cells is a formula. So, so for example, in this cell, it would be equals average of, and so you can define a whole range of cells by using a colon among, uh, between the two. So B3 through B8. And they don't have to be in the same column. Here they're in the same column because that's what's meaningful, but you have to specify the, I think I have it said on the previous, you know, from top left corner to the bottom right corner. So if I say A2 through C4, it's actually this, all these nine cells. <coughs> so I could have had here the average, here the standard deviation, there the count, just how many observations are there, and the standard error of the mean is the standard deviation divided by the square root of sample size, for example. <coughs> so, 
So I could have built up these formulas even, so this cell actually relies on the formula that's calculated here and calculated here. So if you know what actually the formula for the things you can want to calculate, you can set up pre actually pretty complicated stuff. Uh, what if you want to average um, rows that aren't uh, I guess connected? What if you want to average rows three, four, seven, eight? Could you do that? Uh, you can uh, select non-contiguous um, yeah. areas. Uh, I think. Okay, let's see. Uh, to co you know, so one way to do that, you can't really see if I do that, so I collect, and then I think I click on contr control button, and, uh, okay, and select again, and I think I, I don't know, the color doesn't show up, it does show up my screen, so you can collect, select non-contiguous areas. Other way you can, if you type them, you can separate with commas, I think. This area, type this corner to this corner, comma, and this, cor this corner to that corner. But that's really a very, very dangerous practice because you add a row and suddenly all your formulas got messed up. Or maybe they don't. Excel sometimes tries to be smart and update your formulas and sometimes it doesn't. So that's a dangerous thing. Could work, but dangerous. Uh, there are more formulas, so this is just a few simple statistical ones. There is a, a whole formula tab and there is an insert function button and there is a long list of functions, text functions, arithmetic functions, statistical functions, mathematical <coughs> functions, so m many, many functions are available to combine numbers and you know, just transform them or combine them into one. N yes? Uh, uh, so, so here is the formulas. So usually insert function. So you you would ha the way it would work. So it's for example, I want to do the the sum. Okay. So I select the sum function. Uh, I say okay, and then I get a little window, and now I can here select where which areas I want. So I, I might want to click this button that will give, put me out into the spreadsheet. And if I want the sum of these, you know, I select this whole area. And then it will have the sum of, and, and that's where it will put. So, but I generally you don't select the whole function and, uh, click the, so you don't select the whole area and then click the function. So you usually go to the cell where you actually want the result to be, and then, then you select what function you want to use. So you, you, can't, you can't apply a function to a whole column? Yeah, I don't. You just, you just click on the column header rather than the range? Oh, so that's, okay, so I also could do, you know, select, you know, if I say the sum, against the sum, and I could probably select, once I go out here, the whole column. And it will do the sum of the whole column. So it's, it's, this is an abbreviation, 3 to C, that means the whole column. And then I have the sum of the whole column, which is exactly the same thing because I selected the same area. Yes. I'm going to show you more some more complicated stuff, right? So there are other ways to do uh, descriptive statistics besides, you know, this is very flexible. You can do any, many things, but there are some ready-made uh, tools. And one of them in the data analysis tools that I showed you at the beginning how to install, uh, you have a descriptive statistics tool. And what it does, it has some difficulties, uh, but it, I'll show you in a moment what it uh, creates. It, basic summary statistics from mean and standard deviation and counts and a few other things. Uh, one of the, 
Uh, weakness is, is that if you change the data, the results don't get updated. So the f one good thing about the formula is that if you change a number, the results get updated. This does not do that. It's kind of static. Uh, it also has something of a kind of cryptic uh, thing that called confidence level. <coughs> and what it really is, is the margin of error. So this is a way to get a confidence interval. What you have to do is you have to take the mean and add this margin of error and subtract it the margin of error and you get the confidence interval. So, and just a word of warning that there is actually also a confidence function in Excel, one of the built-in functions, but that doesn't give you the right confidence limits. It, it assumes that the variance is known and that's not true in 99.9% .9 of the cases. So. They, they, they kind of look similar, but one gives, they give different answers and the built-in function is, one would call, I would call it wrong. <laughs> so if I want to do uh, the tool, I, the data analysis tool, so it has a variety of options, which I can do, but I'll pick, select descriptive statistics. So I have to select what I want to do, and pretty much I could select, you know, class, you know, these three variables, for example, and I'm selecting right now the whole column cl by clicking on the columns. Uh, it's in columns, and I tell it that the first rows are labeled, so it will not think that the word cholesterol is a data point and complain about it. And then I'll put the output on a new work on a new worksheet. I like to do that so that we don't mix the data with the output. And I select summary statistics and maybe 95% confidence level for the mean. And you can actually have it print a few larger and smallest observations too. So if I do that, oh, complaints now. Let's get rid I hope it's column D that's complaining. Okay, so if I did that, it sp spread out the new sheet and so you can see it has cholesterol and for HDL, mean, standard deviation, median, range, minimum, maximum, all the descriptive statistics. And here's this value for the confidence level, the 18. That's not a confidence interval, but can be readily be used to build a confidence interval. So I could just create a formula here uh, that takes the mean plus uh, the confidence level and the mean, and uh, under it is the mean, minus the confidence level, and then these two values would give me a 95% confidence interval for the mean. But again, this doesn't update if you, get, if you change the data. Another way that people don't really think of for uh, doing descriptive statistics, though even though I think this is the best way of doing them, is uh, the pivot tables. So they are designed to do one or two or even more weight tables, cross tabulations. But they don't, you know, usually you think cross tabulations are frequencies, are counts of how many times something occurs, but really they can put there any number. Well, not any number, uh, a number of statistics they have, uh, certainly mean standard deviation, sums, and a few more useful uh, summaries. So I'll uh, show you in a moment how to do one. But one of the key is that, so first of all, it will allow you to do things by group, for example. So I'll show you how to do uh, the mean uh, cluster and so on by group, not just overall. And I don't have to hunt around where does the group start and end. And also, it will auto-update. So if I, I, I think I have to, you have to push the refresh button there to update it. But if I, you change the data, the table gets updated appropriately. Uh, so, so here is our example data. And we'll, it's in the insert tab. Some of these things are well hidden, but uh, the pivot table. Okay. So I'll select the range of the data, and again, I'll just select these three columns, and I'll put it in a new worksheet so that it doesn't mix up. And it creates this interface. So here's my table, it's just empty at this moment. 
And you can see that it realized what are my variables, group, cluster, and HDL, and I can tell it where to put. So for group, I, as soon as I clicked, it decided, okay, these are the roles, right? You see it, it showed up in the role labels, and that's exactly what I want to do. Now I select cholesterol, it also put them into rows, but that's not what I want to do. I'll pull it into, no, I didn't, oh, I wanted to eat the values. I want mean value of cholesterol, probably. Now, once I put it into values, it automatically said count of cholesterol. So that's not very interesting. I didn't want to count, I want the average, right? Though, of course, maybe count too, that's interesting, but let's do the average. Uh, so I have to click on that little arrow next to it, and then there are settings for this field, value field settings. And here you can see I can select some statistics called summary. So you can do sum, count. So I'll select average, average of cholesterol. Okay, and so now I have the average cholesterol for each group. I, you know, I can also, maybe I can just, pull, yeah, I can pull HDL here. So here with HDL, I can do the, maybe the average, but I also do the standard deviation. So I can pull it here twice. So I already had it once, but I pull it here one, another one time, and now I'll change the setting to somewhere there is a standard deviation. There is the standard deviation. Okay, so now I have the average and the standard deviation of, uh, I, uh, another interesting thing it can do, it can express things as percentages of other values. So for example, I can put in cholesterol there and have it, again, the average, but now I'll go to the show values as, and not normal, but say percent of row, of row. No, not percent of row, sorry, percent of, because percent of row, then it would be, you know, so that the row adds up to 100%. Uh, percent of, and then I'll select of group one, for example. So then what it will do, that the group one will be 100%, and the rest will be the average cholesterol as a percentage of whatever it was in group one. Right, so I added that, so you can see that it's 100%, and the rest are different amount of percentages. So you can build quite nice summary tables combining uh, multiple variables from your data that are grouped by, so this time we only have one grouping variable, but really you could put several row labels here and there is, uh, so you can group it in a variety of flexible ways and this will get updated. And though sometimes you have to push this refresh button to actually have it updated when you change the data. Okay, so this is a very powerful tool for creating summary statistics. Uh, from your data. So some other things that you might want to do, descriptive statistics wise is for example correlations. And correlations, there is a, a both, you, uh, you can go both through the data analysis tool. There is a, a option called correlations where you select your columns and it will give you the correlation coefficient. It doesn't give you a sample sizes, it doesn't give p-values, for example, you cannot do that in Excel, but it will give you the value of the correlation. Or you can do, uh, there is a built-in function, you can give it two columns and it will give you again the correlation coefficient but nothing beyond. And it also should be noted that you can only do Pearson's correlation coefficients. Uh, so, so another commonly used correlation coefficient is Spearman's and if you know what Spearman correlation is, then it actually happens, uh, the way you calculate it is you rank the data and then calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient. So some people thought, uh, might think that, you know, okay, so actually Excel can, there is a function called rank that can rank numbers and then maybe we can use the correlation function either this way or that way to calculate the Spearman correlation, but you cannot because the way the rank function works for tied values is not the way it should for Spearman correlation. So in statistics, uh, the ranks of tied values should be averaged. And uh, so if we have a tie for second and third place, both should go get 2.5. But in the rank function and in other applications, say both get a rank of two. 
right? So you had one, two, two, and in statistics should be one, 2.5, 2.5. So that's why, so it's long story short, I don't know a way of calculating spearman correlation in Excel. So beyond descriptive statistics, so the next usually is to get p-values to do some statistical inference. And really there is very limited support for statistical inference, but there is some. So there's almost no support for categorical data analysis. So if you want a confidence interval for a proportion or do a chi-square test or something like that, you're out of luck. I mean, you can use the formula interface and write your own formulas about those are not very complicated formulas, so you can open the textbook and implement those formulas in Excel, but there is no built-in way of doing that. Uh, for the continuous variable analysis, there are some built-in tools, specific for t-test, ANOVA, and regression. Um, all of them available either through the data analysis tools or through the functions, but it's very, you have to be careful because sometimes the function gives you different results than the add-in. And usually one is correct, the other is wrong. But you know, I have two things to give you different results, but uh, so it's, it's not, you have to be careful using this. And also, if you have a large data set or large numbers, then it can have numeric instabilities and can give really weird results in some cases. So it's certainly not a production level. If you're submitting something to the FDA, you know, don't use Excel, certainly. Um, so the, for the two-sample t-test, in order to use the data analysis tools, uh, you have to have the values for two groups to be contiguous. You cannot have them interspread that a value from group one, then from group two, then you know, some random order. Most statistical packages don't mind at all. Excel really cares that the values have to be next to each other. Mm, so sometimes you have to do some sorting on your data set. Uh, Excel, earlier versions of Excel didn't do it, but they really improved on this, that you, it's really difficult to sort on one column because it used to be that you could accidentally sort one column and so it completely loses the link to the other parts of the data. Now it, Excel will try to help you not to do that. Um, so for example, I'll run a t-test for uh, our two, comparing two groups in our data. So let's go back to our data and I'll compare, say, the cholesterol. I'll do group one, two together and three, four together because for t-test you only need two groups. So I would have to go to data, data analysis, and there are three t-tests, paired equal variances, unequal variances. So since this is not paired data, I'll do say the t-test with unequal variances. So I have to select variable one, make sure that I stop at the right point, and for the second one, three to four. Uh, I don't have labels in the first row, so I don't have to select that, and I'll put in a new worksheet. So you can see here are the results of a t-test. Right, it gets the means, the degrees of freedom, you know, p-values, one tail, two tail, and really this is the one that you would be looking at. This is the two-tailed p-value, right? The probability of getting a more extreme result than the one observed using the t-statistic. Uh, there is also a t-test function uh, when you could say, you know, in the cell you put equal t-test. Uh, so you have to give uh, both ranges and uh, the drawback, it only gives the p-value, it doesn't give the test statistics, the degree of freedom, all the other information that goes with the t-test, it only gives the p-value. You can ask for one or two tailed. This is an option, you know, a one would be one tail, two is two tail. And you can ask an indicator which task do you want. Type equals two would be equal variances, types equals three unequal variances, and type equal one would be the paired t-test actually. So uh, this one function does all three t-tests. Uh, 
And certainly, there is no way, uh, easy way to get a confidence interval out of this. So the PRT test, uh, you can again go through the, either the data analysis, so you saw that there is a PRT test setting. Uh, and there is also the t-test function that um, using with the last option, the type is one, the paired. Now, uh, one problem that here the data analysis tool completely messes up if you have any missing data. Uh, so in, I'll show you the uh, little example, but really the t-test function does fine with the missing data in this situation, but the data analysis tool doesn't. So I have here, I just made a little fake example. So this is what you would get, the fake data uh, with pair test. Uh, and this is, so this is what the t-test function would do. So I would give the two uh, ranges and two-sided but type one, meaning it's a pair test. And here it is, the, exactly the same value given if I go through the data analysis tool. This is everything fine because I have no missing data. Now on the other half, I have, I introduce missing data. Okay. And now this is the value for the t-test function and this is correct if we run with, but uh, the data analysis tool uh, starts getting into problem when it gets the number of observations wrong. And so there are really seven values here, uh, but from a point of view of pair t-test, it's not the number of values, but the number of pairs that counts. So there are really, this has a sample size of six from, because there are six complete pairs. Okay, so this is the point where it goes wrong and everything else afterwards. Uh, these means are kind of correct, but they are not really relevant because for a pair t test, we don't care about those means, but they're means. So everything else beyond that is wrong and you see that the p-value is different too. So, so this is just plain wrong and it doesn't tell you that it's giving you the wrong result. Uh, more complicated analysis is a linear regression and it can do, it, uh, the, uh, it can do multiple predictors. Uh, the restriction is that all the predictors, the X variables, have to be in columns that are next to each other. So you cannot have a column, them in column A and C, you have to get them in A and B because you cannot select a non-contiguous area for this tool. Okay, so they have to be next to each other. You might have to rearrange the data. And if you have, want to try several regressions, you might have to rearrange it multiple times. Uh, it also cannot handle missing values at all. So you have to make sure that the data doesn't have missing values. And while it can do regressions through the origin, some of the rest of the statistics it gives afterwards are wrong, so just don't do it. Okay? In general, regressions through the origin is not a really good idea to do, but uh, in Excel specifically. So again, going back to our example, I can, so I, since I have missing data, right, here, well, uh, I cannot include it, or here, right, with the HDL, I, I cannot include it, so what I can do is sort it so it's somewhere at the end, and when I'm selecting, I will make sure not to select it. So I would have to go to the sorting, and you saw that even though I was on one cell, it immediately expanded to the whole range to try to make sure that I don't sort one column, but I sort the whole data set. So I sort by HTL, smallest to largest, that should be fine. And if it did that, all those missing cells now at the bottom, so I will be able not to use them. So now I'm ready to do regression. Mm, linear regression. Where is it? Regression, there it is. So I'll do a simple regression. My Y variable will be HDL. I uh, will try to predict HDL from the cholesterol levels, from total cholesterol. And my X variable will be the cholesterol. And 
and I might ask for confidence level. So constant is zero, that would be regressions through origin, the one that I don't think you should be using. And you can do, say, uh, some line fit plots. For example, normal probability plots, are, again, are wrong. They are not what people would otherwise consider normal probability plots. So here is the result. Uh, it gives the summary statistics, including R squared, Right, the ANOVA table for regression, this is the p-value for regression for overall significance, and then it will give you individual variables. Now here we have just one variable, but here is the estimate of the intercept and the uh, slope of the line. And it also tries to give a uh, fitted plot, but it looks pretty bad. So what I would do here, I would delete these predicted points, and just to this line, it's possible to add a uh, fitted regression line, trend line. So you can add the trend line, linear trend line, which looks nicer than those points. And then if I select it to edit it, formatting the trend line, I can say even display the equation on the chart. So uh, if you just wanted to do it visually, there is my equation right there. And you can see, hopefully, these coefficients coincide with the ones that were here, right? 38.69 is the intercept, minus 0 0.0492. And of course, I, you know, this is not a nice looking plot. I would have to probably edit it a little bit to make it nicer. So, but you can do linear regression. It gives pretty reasonable summaries of, it, this output is comparable to what you would get from other statistical software. ANOVA, though, is not quite as easy as regression. So there is a built-in ANOVA tool uh, in the data analysis pack, but it only does, actually it does one and two-way ANOVA, but it only does balance when you have exactly the same number of values on each group. And unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. So there is a different trick to go about it, and uh, but if you know that uh, ANOVA is actually a special case of linear regression. So you can set up an ANOVA problem through regression analysis. So what you have to do there is to set up so-called dummy variables. Instead of one variable for group that says one, two, three, four, we create three new variables, but uh, one variable that will be this variable G2, which is one only when you're in group two and zero otherwise. G3 will be an indicator variable for group three, and G4 is an indicator variable for group four. So these three variables together carry the same information as this one variable, right? Because the three zeros means it's group one, one zero zero means group two, right? So the different patterns correspond to different groups. So then you can uh, run a regression with these three predictors and the outcome of the Y, and this will be an ANOVA, you know, the output looks a little bit different, but essentially it's the same thing. Okay. So to, you can, uh, these variables can be set up with a formula. Uh, there is a function that, uh, uh, called if that can give different results based on the condition. So I can set up checking, you know, if A2 equals 2, right, so if this value is 2, then I'll give a 1, otherwise I give a 0. So this formula will tell, look at this value, is it give a one if it's two, otherwise zero. And so I can set it up for every, so I can create three new columns. So here I'll create three new variables, G2. And that, it doesn't matter which, I have to create, pick three groups, doesn't matter which ones I pick, you know, whether it's group one, two, three, or four. Uh, this time I do two, three, four, but any three is okay. So say if, not off, if, if this cell equals two, then I want a one, otherwise I want a zero. So in this cell, I will be checking if this one equals three, then I give a one, otherwise a zero. And here I will be checking equality to four, And then I'll select this, copy them, and 
paste them down. So I created these three new variables, and they are fortunately contiguous next to each other. And now I can again use the data analysis tool, the regression one, and the y range is the same, but the x range, oh no, well, the y range will probably change too. Okay, so I'll select, so again, I'll select this whole thing. And for y, oh, I wanted to select the cholesterol, uh, right. And again, the other settings, I'll, I'll get rid of the line fluid plots because those are not very meaningful here. Uh, so, and this result would be the R square of the ANOVA. And this is really small. The group represents only 5% of the variability on the cholesterol level. You know, it's, this is the p-value from the ANOVA. And it also gives us some estimate of how group two, so the intercept in this case has to be interpreted. Since I omitted group one, I didn't create a variable for that. The intercept in this case means what's the mean in group one. This, and these values says that the group two mean is 11 units higher, group three mean is 11 units lower, and group four means is 16 units lower. So it gives some additional information that ANOVA wouldn't do. Uh, in general, but it does, it's, it's an ANOVA. This ANOVA table is exactly what the ANOVA would be. And, but we didn't have to have it balanced. That's the difference. The post hoc test and other things you might want to in ANOVA are not available here. Okay, so again, the trick is that you can do ANOVA through a regression uh, tool. So, this is really already it's just summarizing what I told you, that Excel has many limitations when it comes to data analysis. You have to be very careful that you have missing data. Some analysis insists that you cannot have missing data. Uh, sometimes they might give you a bad result with missing data. So you have, to, if you don't have missing data, that's always better with Excel. Uh, the arrangement of data, in general, the list arrangement that I showed you is very good, but there are some tools like the ANOVA, if you want to use the built-in ANOVA tool, that would require a different arrangement of the data. They would want you to put the groups next to each other, just like the uh, original I showed you that was like a not so good arrangement, right, when the groups were next to it. That's exactly what the ANOVA tool actually is looking for, except there should be equal number of observations on each group. Uh, you usually wind up with the output scattered, many worksheets or same worksheet in several places, so there is a lot of uh, mass and sometimes it's updated, sometimes it's not updated if you change the data, right, depending how you set it up. Uh, you could have incomplete output or misleading or the labels are not always right. So there are some, mis for example, I really don't like how the p-values are labeled because they are not quite, you know, you would have to know that that's a p-value. Uh, and also, and it's actually a very important uh, problem is that you have pretty much no record of what you have done. Uh, so if you have to do it again, uh, it's very difficult, many things. You really have to go in through and do everything again. And also if someone wants to audit it, whether you did it correctly, right, well, uh, then you can get in trouble because it's not clear because you have just this uh, printout, uh, especially with the data analysis tools that, you know, it's, it doesn't say which data was used for that, where this data is, since there's no link, it's just the result. You know, who knows, if you pushed one long, wrong button somewhere accidentally, maybe you didn't select quite the right range, you omitted one point, you have a bad result, and nobody will ever notice, you know, unless they want to replicate your results. Uh, so this is a slide I found somewhere else, this is not my slide, but I really liked it is that you need the right tool for the right job. And while that so is the right tool for many things, right? You know, if you want to count that three, this is not it. So you have to, you know, if you want to use Excel for statistics, you have to be aware of its limitations, that it is, you know, if you really have a, a serious projects that you really care about, and you might not be 
you might not want to trust it to Excel because you can get in trouble without absolutely knowing it, you know, having no idea that it just does the wrong thing. Uh, some more resources if you want to uh, about statistics or Excel or anything else. So mostly, you know, we are affiliated with the CTSI Institute, right? So we have links from their website. Uh, and this is our uh, biostatistics group's link. So if you have any, need any help in statistics, we are here. And we also have drop-in consulting services, uh, uh, meaning that we have uh, statistician sitting at these locations and you can just walk in and ask questions and if it's a simple question they can answer they'll answer right there or they'll direct you if you need if they decide that that's not as simple as it sounds we have many times we have people with simple questions that turn out not simple at all but they'll direct you uh, to get more help so we have them uh, at the GCRC offices or not GCRC anymore but CTSI of, uh, in, at, in Freighter and we have them at, at the VA and Marquette. I, you asked several questions along the way, but do you have more questions? So there are several options. So first, there are uh, commercial add-ons to Excel. And I, uh, so you, people sell, just like there is the data analysis tool pack, which is part of Excel, but people add other add -on, uh, sell other add-ons. I cannot comment on them, I don't know. Uh, so certainly there are calculators out there on the web uh, that uh, are okay. They're not much in terms of reliable and free and easy to use. That's just too much together. I think these are usually the pick two, and you can get that, but not what necessarily What do you three. use in your department? Do you guys use SAS or MATLAB or R? Uh, for consulting, we mostly use SAS. Exactly. You know, whenever SAS, you know, we also use R less, but, okay. but for, you know, but especially free is all very difficult to find. Or I mean, Excel is not free, but in practice, it's free to most for, people for because research, they have it. For research, most of the time, when you say you want to use that? R, yeah. R is we'll very good, it. but it's not easy to use. It, R, R is free R is and powerful, trade. but it's the non-easy to use. It's not as trade, but there are it's a trade-off. Yeah, so, I, could, yeah, so I just not aware of anything that does all three things at the same time. And people like Stata are actually relatively easy to use. Yes, right. Uh, but Everybody goes for R because it's free. <laughs> R is free, but you know, if you can use R, you know, I love R, but uh, then you're not sitting here because <laughs> you're not looking for simple <laughs> tools. In UCLA, they have the mini tutorials to, for R, so it's statistics and R. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.